In this lesson, we're going to start looking at the first of the two theories that we have to analyse in great detail on this course, and that theory is utilitarianism. So, in this lesson, we're going to meet Jeremy Bentham, define what utilitarianism is, and learn about the principle of utility, the principle of equality, and the hedonic calculus. This is the exam board definition of utilitarianism. And you can see that this theory is interested in consequences and securing the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. To put that into the technical terms that we now know, this theory is consequentialist because it cares about the outcome of actions and not their intentions. It is relativist because whether an action is good or not depends on the consequences, it's relative to the consequences. This theory is teleological and its telos or end or purpose is maximising utility and that's understood to mean maximising happiness for the most amount of people. So in any situation the good thing to do is the thing that makes the most people happy. This theory was put forward by Jeremy Bentham. Now we can see that he builds on foundations that pre-exist him, not least uh, from Epicurus. But he's the person who frames it for the modern age. Now, I've slightly unfairly referred to him there as an oddball, but he really was. He was very eccentric. He had pet walking sticks, for instance, called Dapple and Dobbin. He had a sacred teapot. He um, slept with a pig in an entirely platonic way. He... Um, invented underpants or so it's alleged he in used to go running after lunch round the park which he referred to as a post prandial circumgyration the guy was strange he saw his role in life as demystifying the law that's because the period in which he lived was one of tremendous change he was living at the tail end of the Enlightenment, this incredible process, this movement, which turned Western European thought away from traditional religious observance and towards reason and analysis. He also lives at the start of the Industrial Revolution, where new manufacturing processes were completely changing the way the world looked and the things that we could buy. His world then was a world in transition, and it must have been incredibly exciting to have lived then. So Bentham wants to create a new ethic, a new morality that is stripped of superstition, which is stripped of its religious foundations, which he saw no validity in, and create a streamlined new ethic that would work in the modern world. I mentioned that he's eccentric and that he's an oddball, um, but you can see that for yourself because this is Jeremy Bentham. This is his body, his auto-icon. So intent was he to strip uh, away superstition and, and religious power that he actually, he, rather than being buried, he got his body embalmed and preserved forever. He thought it would be good for people to look upon him and be inspired by him because he was such a fabulous philosopher. The embalming process didn't go quite to plan, though. And whilst that is Jeremy Bentham there, it's not his head. You can see in this older picture that his head is beneath his legs. It turned out to look a little bit ghoulish. It's difficult to find a picture of his head nowadays, but I do have one. There we go. Quite graphic. We're going to use his head um, to attach the quotes to that are the most important ones in utilitarianism. Just like I said in a previous video, this is vital. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. Bentham is noticing something about the world. It's a scientific observation. He is saying this is exactly how people behave. This is a description. And so this makes his theory realistic. Bentham goes on to say that natural rights or human rights, which were a big deal in his time, 
They don't exist. He rejected the contemporary fashion of his day, and we can see it echoed in our own time, that humans have inalienable rights. What he refers to as imprescriptible rights that can't be taken away. He says that's nonsense. In fact, it's nonsense upon stilts. He says there is no such thing. There are no absolute values. There are no moral laws. There are no human rights. There's just pleasure and pain. He was also non-judgmental about the sorts of pleasures and pains that he valued. He just valued pleasure. So a silly game called Pushpin that was played by children and drunks, for him, is as good as poetry. And this certainly offended people at the time. It seemed to underestimate, it seemed to undervalue some types of pleasure. And we'll come back to that. His principle of utility, then is that actions or behaviours are right in so far as they promote happiness or pleasure, and wrong as they tend to produce unhappiness or pain. That's all. That's his entire theory. And radically, he had another principle, the principle of equality, in which he said, every citizen counts, and no one counts more than anyone else. So if you're making a moral decision, you don't favour the aristocrat. You don't favour the landowner. You don't favour the king or the business owner. Everyone counts. This is this was radical stuff. Um, it made him an uh, honorary citizen of France. The French adored this so much after the revolution. But in England at the time, this is shocking. We, we didn't really want to hear this. We weren't really ready for this. Bentham was ahead of his time in many regards. He favoured total equality for the sexes, which is something that we still don't have in, in, uh, in practice in our society. And he even starts to draw animals into ethical consideration, gives them moral weight, saying the question is not whether they can reason, which was the old Christian idea, going back to Aquinas and Augustine, but can they suffer? In short, are they capable of feeling pain? Now, his theory has loads of advantages. It's democratic, way before its time. It's fair, it's realistic, it seems modern and progressive, it's not held back by ancient superstitions based on a holy book that some people might not accept. That's a significant advantage when you live in a liberal and pluralistic society. That means there are a variety of different people with different ideas about what constitutes the good life and what constitutes ethical behaviour. It's a useful method of decision-making for a society like that. And because the focus, is on, the focus is on consequences, it should actually ensure a better world. Now, to help with um, the decision-making... Bentham developed the hedonic calculus, also known as the philosophic calculus, which means the happiness calculator. In it, he isolates seven dimensions or criteria, and he says that we should take these into account when we make moral decisions. So if you can pause this slide and read it. Now, that's a good slide, but actually I prefer another explanation of these seven criteria. And that's on this slide. This is because you can remember it easier with a simple mnemonic, which is Dr. Price. And that means we should consider the duration of pleasure. It's reproduction, which is an easier word to remember and understand than fecundity. And it means how probable is that pleasure um, going to give more pleasure. Purity, which means how pure is the pleasure? Is it likely to be followed by pain? Um, remoteness. When's it going to happen? Intensity, how strong will it be? Certainty, how likely is it? And the extent, how many people are affected? Dr. Price. They're all fairly straightforward to understand, um, but it's going to be more useful to look at them within the context of some examples, which we'll do in a moment. Bentham recognised, though, that it's quite unwieldy and difficult to remember, so being Bentham, he had his own solution and he created a poem. Intense, long, certain, speedy, fruitful, pure, such marks in pleasure that in pains endure, such pleasures seek if private be thy end, if it be public, wide let them extend, such pains avoid, which ever be thy view, if pains must come, let them extend to few. Terrible poem, um, but it might help you if you can remember that for the exam. Now, one aspect of his theory, which is a little bit strange, is he's trying to turn all the experience of humanity into um, a quantitative analysis. That means he's trying to give numbers to things. So he thinks that we should give pleasure points and pain points, and the pleasure points are hedons and the pain points are dolors. And then we add up the pleasure points and the pain points. But this is really confusing, because if an action 
is um, going to extend to loads of people but isn't certain, which is most important, the extent or the certainty? Where do I allocate the points? Also, how many hedons is a year of life worth? Or which experience is worth more hedons, cuddling a puppy or eating a pie? They seem very different. His idea that you can turn moral decision-making into moral mathematics is a good theory, but in practice, what would that scale look like? And we can see the difficulty of it by looking at a handful of examples. Here we are back at the lifeboat case, which I won't go over because I've already explained it in a previous video. On the next slide, I've gone through um, the lifeboat case, applying each of the seven dimensions of the hedonic calculus. Here we are. Read through this slide and see what you think. What action do you think would be most appropriate? Should we kill the young lad or should we let him live? It isn't completely obvious which course Bentham would advocate we take, but I think it's more likely that he would say killing the young lad was acceptable, simply because of the, the extent three lives are saved. Um, yes, we didn't know if it would absolutely work, so certainty was a little bit dodgy. Um, it was an intense pain, but its duration was short. It's unlikely that such a, a, a situation will be reproduced, so it doesn't set too bad an example. Uh, for other people to follow, and the fact that it allows 120 years of life probably means that it was a, a good thing to do. So it's not 100% clear, but I'd say most um, utilitarians following the hedonic calculus would probably think killing the boy was acceptable. Now that's all well and good, but let's consider a new ethical dilemma, the Christian in the Colosseum. Here you have someone who is being persecuted and killed simply for having a different view to the majority. Imagine the Colosseum full of 50,000 people who are baying for the blood of the Christian, who they consider to be an enemy of the empire, an enemy of their people, and they've turned up to see that Christian be torn apart and killed. Most people nowadays would say that would be totally immoral. To kill someone simply for expressing an alternate religious preference, we would consider sickening and unjust, in the main. However, will that be the case when we apply Bentham's hedonic calculus? Because remember, he doesn't believe in human rights. So let's see. Again, pause the video and read these. Now, the problem we have here is the numbers. 50,000 people might enjoy watching this person get killed. And that adds up to an awful lot of pleasure. And there's only one person who's getting killed. So their family will grieve for them if they have any family. Um, but 50,000 versus that one person. Also, you could argue that it will ensure stability in society because they will see what happens when someone goes against the empire. So that might sound out a good message which, which will secure um, a stable society. Also, it could work as a pressure valve. It, it will release some pressure. You've got some angry people and they go and see someone get killed and then that calms them down and then they don't go and commit murders themselves. But on the other hand, the intensity of the tragedy should surely weigh against the act. To be perfectly honest, it's not clear what Bentham would advocate here, but I think we could argue that he would allow the, the person to die, that the needs of the majority do outweigh the needs of the minority, and that is more than a little bit troubling. He thinks that the majority interest is the most important thing, and because there are no human rights protecting that minority interest, then, unfortunately, the, to maximise pleasure, it might involve killing the Christian in the Colosseum. Even if the pleasure that that innocent person is being killed for is the sadistic, sick pleasure of enjoying watching someone die. For Bentham, there are no moral absolutes, and all we should worry about is maximising pleasure. 
Having seen those two examples, what do you think of Bentham's utilitarianism? Do you think it's a success?